investigation of the reactivity of HCFC 131A over chromium oxide, and our presenter is Stephen York. Stephen, do you want the mic? Um, I don't know. Can you hear him? Can everybody hear? Can you hear me okay? Yeah. I got a big mouth. My name is, is Steve York, and I work with Dr. Cox in the surface science lab at the, in the chemical engineering department at Virginia Tech. I'm going to talk to you today about some work that I've done on, on, um, is there a pointer? Yes, is there a, you want the pointer? Yeah, a little laser pointer, I guess. That's right. Okay. Hydrochlorofluorocarbon 131A over a single crystal surface of CO203, specifically the 1, one bar O2 surface. Uh, a little background uh, for this work. The, uh, the use of Freon or CFC12 is being phased out worldwide, as I'm sure you're all aware due to its ozone depleting potential. Uh, chromium oxide is a common catalyst used in manufacturing hydrofluorocarbon 134A, also called R134A. It's the common, commonly used substitute for freon. Chromium oxide is a common catalyst used in manufacturing R134A from trichloroethylene. HCFC 131A, or F131A, I'll call it from now on, is a is the first intermediate in the reaction sequence from TCE to to the R134A. All of the reactions, all of the experiments, which I'll I'll talk about this afternoon, were conducted in in an ultra high vacuum environment over a single crystal of CR203, and this has conducting experiments in ultra high vacuum has the advantage of minimizing some of the some of the unknowns that you have to contend with, uh, as well as the single surface, the uh, single crystal surface also minimizes some of the unknowns that you have to contend with in a industrial type of environment. I'll speak a little bit about my system first. My ultra high vacuum system had a base pressure of approximately 1 times 10 to the minus 10 torr. That, that pressure was maintained throughout the reaction, throughout the experiments that I conducted, except while I was actually dosing the reactive molecule onto the, to the surface of the, of the sample. The sample has been oriented by Lowry vacuum scattering so that only the 1, 1 bar O2 surface is exposed, and the sample temperature may be varied from minus from 150K through 1100K. Reactant gases are dosed into the, into the system and onto the sample surface through a variable leak valve. The techniques I had at my disposal in this system are as follows. A low energy electron diffraction or, or lead. That was used primarily to verify the surface periodicity before experiments, as well as to look for surface reconstructions and and uh, disordering <coughs> caused by caused by surface reactions. Also used OJ electron spectroscopy or AES, and we use that to measure the relative concentrations of atomic surface species. And thermal desorption spectroscopy was used to measure the desorption of gaseous products from the sample surface. This was by far the most critical technique used in this work, so I'll talk just a little bit more about it. As different people do it in different ways. The way we perform thermal resorption spectroscopy, or TDS, is we cool the sample down to, that would be at this stage here, to 150 degrees K. Then we 
leak the reacting gas into the leak valve and onto the, directly onto the surface. We give the exposure in, uh, in terms of langmeters, with one langmeter being one times 10 to the minus six tor seconds. We dose the molecules onto the surface, allow the, the background gases to pump down. Then we run a linear temperature ramp and, uh, and use a mass spec to monitor desorption products as they come off of the surface. At, at this point, there are basically three paths that the, the adsorbed molecules are three options for the adsorbed molecules. They could either be reactant molecules, which, which, undergo, which undergo no reaction and just reach a critical temperature for desorption and they desorb without reaction. Or they have reacted already in their product molecules, also waiting for a critical desorption temperature to be obtained. Or they are still reactant molecules sitting on the surface waiting for a reaction temperature to be obtained. And when that temperature is reached, the, the reaction occurs in the product molecules disorb. That would be the reaction limited desorption case, whereas if they reacted immediately in the product molecules sitting on the surface, that would be a desorption limited case, and that'll, that'll come into play a little bit. The, the sample is in very close proximity to a mass spectrometer. Uh, the mass spectrometer is outfitted, the sensor of the mass spectrometer is outfitted with a quartz skimmer so that that uh, background signals from hardware and the like is, is minimized and we see only the desorption signal from the, from the sample surface. The objectives of, of my overall project are to investigate the chemistry involved in the reaction in the reactions from TCE to 134A over the chromium oxide catalyst and to study site requirements involved in those reactions. Specifically in this work, 131A, which is a, an intermediate on that pathway. Also want to investigate surface phenomena which we've observed to both promote as well as poison the activity of the CR203 catalyst. about my surface here. This is a computer model of the chromium oxide, CR203, one, one bar O2 surface. It is a, uh, this is a, it's a surface cell going on. As you can see, it's very nearly square. The ratio of size is about 0.94. Uh, it's a nonpolar, stable surface. It has a stoichiometric repeating unit, five layers five layers deep, that would be perpendicular to the surface that you're looking at there. Um, cations are in the plus three oxidation state and they have one coordination vacancy for a cation. The cations in the next layer, as you can see here, are fully coordinated. Um, uh, I should also mention that chromium oxide is an insulating material and that causes some problems with performing the lead and the AES. Um, I have to I have to heat the sample to to 800 degrees K in order to perform AES, and about 725 K in order to get good good lead patterns off of. Let's try move on to some data here. This is a thermal desorption spectrum or a series of thermal desorption spectrums of a uh, reaction where I've dosed three hundredths of a langmeter of F131A onto the sample surface. And these are the desorption features which, uh, which result. This is a molecular desorption feature from the, the dosing molecule, the 131A. This is the major product, which I see, F1131A. And this is a minor product, which is acetylene. Uh, in case you, you're not familiar with the terminology for F131A and, and these other halocarbons, this is the structure for, for F131A. It is, it's, it's just 112 trichloro one fluoroethane 
and then the major product, F1131A, is a result of taking off this chlorine and one of these chlorines to form a ethane derivative. And then removal of the rest of the halogens and, uh, and a rearrangement results in the, in the minor sediment product. Um, this is the overall surface reaction here. The chlorine and the fluorine, which is removed from the, from the dosing molecule and from the F1131A, become bound to the surface. And uh, no, no other products whatsoever are seen, no chlorine or fluorine containing products, no, no water, no carbon dioxide or carbon monoxide. Um, I do want to stress that that all of these, these spectra were not taken from the same run. On the initially, you get almost no 131A back off, indicating nearly 100% conversion. Um, these two features, this feature especially, dominates initially with the seven uh, also clearly visible. And then after about five runs, this feature, this feature dies off dramatically. The acetylene is gone even before that, and then the F131A grows in rapidly to a, to a constant level once the surface deactivates completely. Um, I'll set this one aside and come back to that in a moment and talk about the, some kinetics associated with that. The quantities of, of products and reactants evolved from the surface um, are as follows. Like I said, the, the ethene derivative, the 1131A, starts out very high and then rapidly drops off after, after about a tenth of a Langmuir worth of exposure. The F, I'm sorry, the acetylene also undergoes the same kind of a pattern, not much of it's formed to begin with, and then it rapidly drops off. And the F131A peak, the dose, this is the dosing molecule, grows back in to a, to a constant level as the surface shuts down. The next logical step to investigating this reaction was to do thermal desorption using the, the major product, F1131A, primarily to, to see whether or not the, the acetylene was formed going through the F1131A intermediate or through, through a parallel pathway which didn't involve the ethane derivative. Uh, this slide the slide of the ethene dosing the HCFC 1131A, and it clearly over the, the same surface. It clearly shows that the the acetylene is formed from the from the ethene. This a, a further reaction of that. This is the the F1131A desorption feature. It's a molecular peak that grows back in as, uh, as a series of, of constant size doses is, is performed. The acetylene peak dies off, especially this feature here, which corresponds in temperature to this broad feature for the, the F1131A. And uh, that's important because this is a clue that they could arise from a common surface intermediate since they desorb at the same temperature. Um, following, following relative quantities of, of F1131 and acetylene over, over this reaction, you see that the acetylene actually goes through a, goes through a maximum. This indicates that there is, as I mentioned, there's fluorine constantly being deposited on the surface. These reactions, a little bit of fluorine, but especially fluorine. And uh, this maximum here indicates that there's some critical surface chlorine concentration that constitutes a, a surface ensemble, which initially begins to favor this reaction. And then as more chlorine is added to the surface, it begins to poison the surface towards that reaction. Okay, now, uh, one other thing here. This is the, 1131A product. Note that the desorption temperature here is 190K, and I'll say make note of, uh, of these two 
desorption temperatures. And then I'll put my main reactant back up here, the ethane derivative. And you'll notice that the F1131A desorption temperature is much higher here. It's 241K. Uh, this indicates that this feature is a second order, a second order recombination feature, a uh, reaction limited feature, which, uh, you know, which comes possibly from a common surface intermediate. You see that these two overlap a little bit. There's also, it's also possible there's a common surface intermediate which can either recombine to form the F131A or give rise to the F1131A. Uh, you notice also that the temperatures, the desorption temperatures for a sediment are the same, they're identical. Um, this, so this feature, I believe, is a molecular desorption feature. This is a reaction limited second order feature, uh, which constitutes the major product. And, uh, the acetylene, I believe that this is a reaction limited feature which occurs only over the bare surface because this feature dies out very quickly. It's, it's larger than the lower temperature feature now, but over a series of just two or three runs, this feature goes almost completely away, whereas this feature does not. I've never seen it actually go completely away. So that would, indi that would indicate that that this one is probably a molecular desorption feature. As I said, these, both of these compounds deposit chlorine and fluorine on the surface. And uh, I used OJ electron spectrometry to, to, follow, to follow the uh, deposition of chlorine onto the surface. These are typical OJ spectrum of a clean, this is a clean surface, and a chlorine saturated surface. Um, the, the only point here being basically that obviously chlorine is easy to see. And um, did a series of experiments where after doses, after small doses of 131A and 1131A, I would, uh, I would run AES and quantify the amount of chlorine relative to the amount of surface chromium and I got the following results. Uh, interestingly enough, the F1131A and the, the F131A reach different maximums of chlorine contents. You can't push the 1131A past a chlorine chromium ratio of 0.16, whereas the F131A, the alkane derivative, quickly rises up to a maximum of 0.26 with chlorine to chromium ratio. And uh, this, this surface reaction very quickly shuts down. As you can see, it's not even a quarter of a line there, and it's shut down. And, and out here, you, the reaction has largely shut down. It's the yield of, uh, of a sediment that you would do. That's the only product that you would see during this run, the yield of a sediment drops to five or ten percent of, of its maximum rate, but but it never completely shuts down. Now I tried to tie these two these two sets of experiments together with the the OJ findings and the thermal absorption and see if, in fact, the, the deposition of chlorine on the surface is related to the activity of the surface. And uh, this, uh, this slide clearly shows that, that indeed it is. As this, the ground squares are sediment production measured from, from TDS experiments performed with the 1131A, and the green stars are the Chlorine to chromium ratio measured by AES during the same set of runs. As you can see, they track each other. They track each other almost perfectly. The, um, the surface shuts down. By the time you get to this point, you basically have produced all the acetylene that you're that you're going to produce, and you've reached your maximum chlorine to chromium ratio on the surface. I should mention here too that there's no carbon. 
observed on the surface at all. I've never seen any carbon deposited on the surface. For a lot of these reactions, um, a big culprit for deactivating the catalyst has, has always been claimed to be a coking of the surface. And uh, at least for, for this type of reaction in this environment, uh, the carbon was not a factor. So from this, I can draw several conclusions. First of all, that the ethene derivative, F131A, is by far the major product formed in the reaction of F131A over the chromium oxide 1, 1 bar O2 surface. And that uh, acetylene is also formed as a minor product. Uh, desorption features which occur at the same temperature range for the for the acetylene product and for the ethene derivative, the F1131A, occur at the same temperature, and this is just a common intermediate for, for these two products. The acetylene, if you dose F1131A onto the surface, only the only product observed in that reaction is I'm sorry, if you dose 1131A onto the surface, the only product observed is the acetylene. And, um, and the F1131A deposits chlorine on the surface through an overall 1,2-dichloro elimination reaction. And uh, H1131A also deposits chlorine on the surface, but to a somewhat lesser extent. The surface activity towards the 131A is eventually poisoned by the presence of, of uh, chlorine on the surface and, and again no carbon was found whatsoever. And uh, also, and this is a complicating factor to, to some of these experiments, is that chlorine and fluorine both desorb, uh, both undergo electron stimulated desorption from the surface which makes, I have to do my OSHA experiments really fast in order to, in order to collect a signal. Uh, and in fact, Fluorine, chlorine is not too bad. The fluorine is almost impossible to quantify. I can see a bump there, and if I run, if I run just three or four scans, and then run another one, it's, it's gone at that point. The chlorine, it takes an hour or so for a saturated surface to, it takes an hour of sitting in an electron beam for the chlorine signal to go away. So I think I have good numbers on the chlorine, but the fluorine is, is very tough to quantify. Uh, as far as future work, several things need to be done still. Uh, first and foremost, I need to do acetylene. I need to do thermal desorption with acetylene over the surface in order to, in order to get a handle on the kinetics for the acetylene desorption piece, decide whether or not that low temperature desorption feature for the acetylene was in fact a molecular desorption feature. And um, need to examine the reactivity of other, of other halocarbons on this TCE to F134A reaction pathway. They include, they include HCFC132B and HCFC133A, and that's, that's the sequential pathway from TCE to F134A. Uh, my plan is to also perform TDS and some experiments with, with, those, with those reactants. Also, I want to go to another system and use XDS in order to probe surface cation size before and after reaction to see if there's a change in oxidation state. And uh, finally, propose some mechanistic models to put it all together and make it make sense. Non-polar and stable. We didn't think that it would reconstruct. If, uh, we want to selectively. I, I guess I'll, I'll answer a little bit more deeply. We're in the overall project, and I won't be doing all of this, but uh, there were a series of graduate students. They're going to look at at various surfaces that have different degrees of, uh, of unsaturation, coordinated unsaturation, and uh, that was the one that, that I got. That's, 
for the target. If, if you were to prepare a chromium oxide or a supported chromium oxide uh, catalyst, would you expect this to be one of the stable surfaces that would be, would be present? I'm not real sure. I guess it would depend on how you prepare that, that supported catalyst. I know that, that industrially support, you know, supported catalysts are, are typically what is used. Um, I don't really know. How did you get the surface? Did you uh, cleave it or did you grow it? We cut it in half, oriented it on a jig using a Lowy back refraction, back to scattering, and sent it to a uh, gemologist. To, to ground it down parallel to the 1-1 one, one bar O2 surface and sent it back to us. Then I mounted that into a sample holder with the, with the back occluded and, and held on to uh, <coughs> a, a manipulating stage. Well, didn't the grinding affect the surface? Oh, it's polished like a piece of glass. I mean, it, it's polished like yeah. a piece of glass. And in, and in uh, I, I didn't really mention, but I also have a, an ion bombardment gun and, and I can my typical sample preparation is I ion bombard it to clean any any background gases or reactant gases which may have been absorbed to the surface and, uh, and then anneal it for about five minutes at a thousand K and, uh, before I do any of these experiments.